Well, welcome, Crossbridge. How's everybody doing today? All right, good deal, yeah. As Nathan said, it is opening weekend of the NFL. Uh, to me, in our home, that's like a second holiday. Uh, here's Christmas, and the opening weekend of NFL is kind of right there. Well, it is for me, Whitney, not so much. But, but anyway, I'm so glad that you guys are here with us this weekend. As you can see, I'm getting to represent my green and gold. Can I get a go, pack, go? Yeah, three of you. Good deal. Good deal. Well, hey, uh, so this weekend, the, uh, the number that you guys were supposed to hit was 1360. Uh, the number is about to be revealed. Can I get a drum roll, please? All right, let's see the number. Ah, so 1360, and then attendance that we had on the weekend where we set that goal was 1,238. So everybody give yourself a big round of applause for helping me out that I don't have to be in one of those Bears jerseys. But anyway, I'm so whoa, glad whoa, that whoa, you... Whoa, whoa. All right, I, I'm tired of this. All right, you got ahead of yourself, okay? <laughs> See, the matter of fact is we forgot to enter United's numbers from Paint Wars. Oh. Uh. So... We had 176. Uh. So I, I guess that means that this belongs to you. Uh. All right, well, I'm not taking this off because I don't want this touching my skin. All right, unbelievable. I don't even know who... Uh. All right. Well, church tonight is going to be about five minutes. <laughs> All right. Good job, everybody. Ah, well, anyway, welcome to Crossbridge. My name is Pastor Harold. I have the privilege of serving here as lead pastor, except for this weekend. And uh, But no, I'm so happy to be a part of what's going on here at Crossbridge. Hey, we're in week two of the non-hurried life. So I encourage you, I'm going to do a shameless plug for the book again. I encourage you to go on Amazon, go online, and purchase The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I know some of you have already purchased the book. You've been messaging me, and I've gotten phone calls and emails, and some of you are even tagging me on Facebook talking about how the book is already impacting you. So I, I I encourage you to go and get that book. I think it's like seven bucks, eight dollars. So it's it's cheap. Go get it, and you will and you will not be disappointed. But if you weren't with us last week, I want to kind of give you an opportunity to get caught up and kind of get in rhythm with us as we're navigating this series, the non-hurried life. So one of the big takeaways that we had from last weekend was this: was this notion of Jesus was busy. But we talked about how the busy in our life can sometimes be chaotic. It can sometimes be frantic. It, sometimes it can cause us to not have a ton of clarity when we have to make decisions or whatever the case may be. And quite frankly, no matter what season of life you're in, you're going to have the stuff. There's going to be things on your calendar. There's going to be things that you have to accomplish at work. There's going to be things that you need to do and should do for your children. And quite frankly, there's just the stuff. And so one of the passages that we talked about last week was this notion of Jesus is inviting us. He's inviting you and me to partner with him, to, to take on his yoke, because he told us last week that my yoke is easy and light. Now, I told you that I wish I said, hey, Pastor Harold, come to me, take my yoke. I'm going to take all your stuff. But that's not how it works. Because Jesus, when he was here physically on this earth, he had stuff. He had responsibilities. He had things that had to be done. He had things that he had to take care of. But what he's wanting to do and what he's inviting you and I to do is to come and partner with him, to take on his yoke. And we're going to be learning over the next few weeks as we navigate this series together of how Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, is going to help you and I carry the stuff better, to be more and more like him. So I got a question that I want to start with you today. It is this. What is it worth to you? Talking about the lifestyle of Jesus, what is it worth to you? As I was working on this, this message, I, I kind of started to think about 
the things that really matter to me, the things that I find great worth in. And, and maybe they, these are going to be things that, that you don't, right? But one of the things that I'm talking about is what is it worth to you, the lifestyle of Jesus? Th- th- that question got me to ponder about, well, just different kind of lifestyles. You know, uh, America, our country is a boiling pot of tons of different cultures, but, but that's a very big concept to kind of get into, like, what is your culture worth to you, right? And so that can mean a number of different things of where you live in the country, from the south to the north to the coast, all the different stuff, right? But so I, I kind of wanted to narrow that down a, a, a little bit, a little bit simpler, a little bit smaller so my brain could comprehend it. So cultures and lifestyles, I, I kind of started to think about, well, even all over the country in America, there's these very niche cultural differences that people have, these little things that they find attractive to them, the things that mean a lot to them. And so what am I getting at? I started to think about like people who ride motorcycles. That's supposed to be a joke, right? But like, but, but, no, but, but in, 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 in all seriousness, but like people who ride motorcycles in the sense of like, it's kind of a subculture. People who ride motorcycles, especially Harleys, like that's their thing. Right. And so and I got to thinking about it. Well, well, Pastor Harold, why is it a culture? Why is that relevant to what you're talking about? Because the the reason being is because people who ride motorcycles, you know, like they have their own clothing. I mean, they they have their own restaurants and stops on the interstate and they have rallies and all this different stuff. And quite frankly, like there's motorcycle churches. Right. And so it's this very cultural relevant thing, but it's also this very niche thing. And so people who have Harleys and have motorcycles, it means a lot to them that it becomes part of their identity. Uh, Another kind of uh, culture thing that I was thinking about is like Western cowboys. I want to be a cowboy. Right. I always wanted to be a cowboy. Whitney won't let me. But I was thinking about that kind of the same thing, like, like this, this group of people who live this lifestyle, like they protect it with all that they have. I mean, they have their own style of clothing, their own food, their own restaurants, right? They have their own events. They have their own churches as well, right? All over the country, there's these things called cowboy churches. It's just kind of like its own breed of people. But then there's also another subculture that I kind of relate to the most is golfers, Right. So golfers, they kind of have their own subculture as well. I don't think it's as tense as people who ride motorcycles or if you're a cowboy. But but golfers have this subculture where they have their own clothing. Right. They have the polos and the sweaters and the plaid. Thank goodness plaid's going out of date. Right. So so they, they have all this stuff and they have their little groups and they have their events and, and they have this own kind of little subculture. Now. Maybe some of you in here today, maybe some of you don't resonate with golf, but I think you're going to be able to here in just a minute. As I was working on this message and kind of working through this weekend, I started to think about, well, what is golf worth to me? If, if, if you don't know much about me, I'm a big golfer. I love to play. I love to play. Are there any other golfers in here today? Would you raise your hand nice and proud? Yeah, there's a few of you. Thank you. I love to play. It means a lot to me. It means a ton to me. I'm a major golfer. And so I was working on this message today and and I was doing some research on golf. Roughly in America, there's, let me see, there's 20, nearly 26 million people that play golf. That's a pretty big culture. Nearly 26 million people play. Out of the 26 million people, golf generates nearly 40 billion annually. Now, but here's the interesting fact about golf and golf culture. So I was doing some research. In the 1950s, golf saw a a major increased spike in people playing the game of golf. Like, I mean, it just kind of went off the charts when I was doing this research. And so that got me to thinking about, well, man, like, well, what was going on in the 50s that would create this huge boom in the game of golf? And so I was doing some research and I was like, well, I mean, Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer, they were getting popular around then and the radio was more popular. Were TVs invented yet? I, I don't know that, right? Maybe you were like, Pastor Harold, you're pushing my buttons, right? So, but, but anyway, so I, I, I just got to thinking and, and I was doing some more research and it dawned on me. Something very unique was invented in, 19, in the 1950s for the game of golf. Can anybody take a guess what that was? The golf cart. The golf cart. And so in the 50s, you saw this incredibly inclined, steep participation in the game of golf. And that got me to thinking, 
that got me to thinking about my passion for the game of golf. If God snapped his fingers and said, no more golf carts, would you still play? I don't know, that's a lot of walking. If you don't know what that's like, it's like miles to play a round of golf, to walk it. And if you play with me on a bad day, I'm on this side of the course, and I'm on this side, and I'll go over here, right? I mean, it's brutal. I mean, like, that is by far the worst part of the game. But, well, what has this got to do with this series? The reason why I'm kind of telling you all of this is I think our pace of life is really important. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is, 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 the, is the pace of Jesus. If, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. Pull this up on your phone and please put this in your phone so you have it in there. In the book we read, hurry is violence on the soul. Hurry is violence on the soul. And so what does that mean? That means that we have to be intentional with the pace of our life. And so I brought up the golf thing because... I'm a big golfer. I played in high school. I, I've played some tournament golf. Um, and I haven't walked in a long time because when you play tournament golf, you have to walk. And I haven't walked a golf course in many, many years. It's been a long time since I've walked. But this got me to thinking about, because usually when I'm in a golf cart, it's there to make the game easier, to speed the game up, to speed up the pace of play. But ironically enough, when I play, I have always played better when I get the chance to walk. Hurry is violence on the soul. Now, maybe you're not a golfer, but maybe you can begin to kind of put those points and those pieces together in your own life and how they can resonate with you. How many, how many seasons and situations have you been in your life where you knew your pace was a little quick? Maybe your pace was completely out of control. And so today we're going to learn about the importance of the pace of Jesus. I don't know about you, but when, when I go through really important seasons and really important moments in my life, how many of you just try to rush it? I do. There's been a lot of times in my life where I have rushed to conclusions. I have not tried to control my pace. Have you ever had somebody tell you when you're going through something or maybe you're even physically running? Have you ever had somebody like tell you, hey, Harold, you need to pace yourself? There's a lot of wisdom packed into such a simple quote. How many of you would agree with that? Hurry is violence on the soul. So the importance of pace, what does pace mean? To define it, it is this consistent and continuous speed. Now, how many of you feel like you go through overdrive, then you're going slow, then you're back into overdrive, and you just have this chaotic, frantic pace in your life? <laughs> I love one of the words in the definition of pace. It's this idea of consistency. Who in here would love some more consistency in their life? I know I would love it in my short game because it's horrible. But not only do I want consistency in my golf game, how many of you guys would say, Pastor Harold, I crave more consistency in my relationship with Jesus? Because there's, there, there's times when I rush and I miss him. There's times when he's speaking to me, but, but, I, but, but, but my pace is off and I don't give him the space I don't create the time to allow him to be a consistent voice in my life. In the passage today, we're going to be in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time when this passage is being preached about, when it's being taught about, it's going to be referring to salvation. That the only way that you and I can inherit the kingdom of God, to be with him in glory and glory after and after, is only through Jesus Christ. It's only through him. It's only through his, only through his blood that he shed for you and me that we can have eternity with our heavenly father. 
In the Christian faith, this is one of the most principal, principal things about ultimate truth when it comes to our pathway to Jesus in heaven. But one of the interesting things about this passage, and I've taught on it, I've taught you guys before on this. One of the things that I really appreciate about this is that I am the way and the truth. And and what we're going to be continuing to talk about today, and I'm going to share some more stories with you in just a moment. The way of Jesus, his pace, his slowness, his, 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 his inability to be rushed or hurried. The way of Jesus. There's a story about Jesus in the New Testament between him and a man named Lazarus. And so I don't know if you know the story or not, but I'm just going to summarize it for the sake of time. Lazarus has fallen sick. He has two sisters, Mary and Martha. So who do Mary and Martha choose to turn to? They choose to turn to Jesus. Wise choice. But Jesus does something kind of interesting in this moment. You would think that Jesus, after hearing such news, would be frantic because he loved Lazarus. Lazarus was very close to him. But Jesus doesn't simply rush or hurry. After hearing the news, he waits two days before heading to Lazarus. And of course, by the time he gets to Lazarus, Lazarus has done passed away. That's why Jesus had gone to him. Lazarus has done passed away and Jesus is on his way back. And and as soon as he gets back to the location, he finds Mary and Martha very upset, frustrated. How else should they have responded? They just lost a family member. They were furious. It, it, It was a moment of pure chaos and violence. But Jesus wasn't. Jesus didn't rush his way back to the situation. There's another story when Jesus is on this boat with his disciples. Jesus, they're, they're, they're crossing this body of water with his disciples and, and this massive storm comes up. And so I got a little quiz for you. And maybe, I don't know if you've ever heard that story. You can take a guess. But they're on this boat. This massive storm comes up. Is it A, Jesus was driving the boat? B, he was on the radio looking for help? C, he got on Instagram to share his opinion about how bad the storm was? Or four, Jesus was napping? Did I just go like A, B, and then like switch to numbers? I'm sorry. This Bears jersey's wearing off on me. Ah. So he was napping, right? For Andy, he was napping. So he he was napping, right? He was napping. But when the storm was going on, the disciples were frantic. They were losing their mind. It, It was this moment of pure chaos and turmoil. Literally, like they're having to grab Jesus by the shoulders and shake him to wake him up. And they're saying, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Jesus was never violent. All throughout his ministry, all all the seasons and situations and moments, he was never violent. He was never rushed. He was never hurried. Jesus was never violent, but the people were. Can you think about moments in your life where the seasons has has caused violence around you? You see, the, 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 the point of all of this is to become more and more like Jesus. You know, I I find it very uh, convicting that I know in my relationship with Jesus, there there there's so many times where I have found myself trying to be the Holy Spirit. I, I have found myself trying to speak into situations that I have no business to. There have been moments when I have put my foot in my mouth because I've done something like that. 
And I had a, a wise person speak into me one time. He said, Harold, he said, I think, I think too many pastors try to be the Holy Spirit when they need to be more like Jesus. You know, I don't know if you know this about Jesus, but Jesus took the time and created the space for the pace of his life. You know, to be more like Jesus is, uh, you know, Jesus took naps. Jesus took the time to remove himself from a situation to pray. Jesus took the time to truly control his pace. Well, Pastor Harold, that sounds great and all, but, it, but if you could see my calendar, if you could see my to-do list, if you could see the things that I have to try to accomplish, you, you wouldn't be asking me to control the pace because I can't let up. How many of you feel like that today, that there's things in your life you just cannot let up on? You know, I, I think so many of us, myself included, I will almost die on the altar of efficiency because that's the green light that I give myself to be as busy as I am because as long as I'm busy, that means I'm being efficient. That means I'm getting the most, I am milking the most out of every minute, hour, day that I can. I am being efficient. But as I was writing this message and God was speaking into me, I, I immediately began to be convicted because I will die on the altar of efficiency, but God was asking me, Harold, but are you being effective? Harold, could you trust me to create a little bit better of pace in your life so you can have a little bit of margin for me to speak into you? Because I know for a fact there have been times when I've, I've missed his voice because of the pace of my life. And so here's where the message gets really, really hard. Pastor Harold, once again, that sounds good. I can relate to that. That resonates with me. But love, friends, love is painfully time consuming. To be like Jesus, to be like love, to be able to handle the pace, to be able to handle the stuff, to be able to carry the stuff that he wants us to do so, Love is hard because love is painfully time consuming. And, and once again, that's where the conflict is. No matter what season of life you're in, whether you're a child, whether you're a student, whether, whether you're a brand new young family or you are even in your retirement age, time is something that we're all, we're all fighting. We're all fighting time. You know, I, I said last week that there's something going on with my watches because the time, it just it gets faster. It's not slowing down and it's definitely not going backwards. And I know that this doesn't sound very encouraging to you right now in this moment, but it, but it boils down to this. I've got stuff I've got to work on on the pace of my life to be more like Jesus. I have to. God's got to help me in a powerful way. But the question that we're going to leave with today is this, what do you want to be defined by? Do you want to be somebody who is defined by love or do you want to be somebody who is defined by hurried? I know for me, friends, I want to be known for being as much like Jesus as humanly possible. And I still have a long way to go. But friends, I believe that the God of the universe who has so many other things to worry about, that he's once again inviting you and me to partner with him, to create some margin, to create a healthier pace. Not just to be efficient, but to be effective as a spouse, as a mom or a dad, as a coworker, 
a teacher. God wants you to be effective for the kingdom. You know, in just a moment, we're going to sing a song, one of my all time favorites. It's called There Is a Cloud. And it's talking about this notion of blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing that Jesus wants to pour over each and every one of us. And I know I'm up here today and I'm talking about pace and I'm talking about creating margin in your life and I'm talking about all this different stuff and you say, Pastor Harold, once again, it sounds good, but there's just no way. Friends, would you just let the God of the universe speak to you right now in this moment? Because he sees you. He's inviting you in. And if you're able, would you get on your feet as we continue to worship?